I'm going to be rounding up the series that uh, was started on Monday. I, you know, my sister and my brother, they've done a marvelous work of laying the foundation and building upon that foundation. Uh, we continue with proofs of my walk in the spirit. And our foundation scripture is um, Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. Now, I'm going to start by telling you a story. I had this story a while back. I don't know if it's true, but it's, it doesn't remove from the lesson that I've learned from this story. Now, there was a girl called Test, uh, Tess, sorry, and um, her brother was ill, almost dying, and she overheard her parents one day talking that they were going to be moving out of their home and moving into a block of flats because the medical bills had been so high and they were running out of money. So this girl, very precocious girl, you know, a lot older than her age, smarter than uh, uh, most kids her age. She, she just went, went into her room and brought out her money jar, poured the money on the, on the bed and started to count. She counted three times to make sure that she got the same amount each time. And whilst her parents weren't looking, she went out six blocks away from their house. She went to this pharmacy. And when she got to the pharmacy, the pharmacist was there talking to another man. So this girl was like, can't he see me? You know, so she shuffled, banged her feet. Maybe it will catch the attention of the pharmacist. The pharmacist was engrossed in this conversation with the other man. And she <coughs> cleared her throat. The pharmacist didn't budge. So she thought, what would, I, what would I do to catch his attention? She took a coin from her and slammed it on the counter. And the pharmacist, what's up with you, little girl? Why are you being rude? You know, she, and can you not see? I'm talking to my brother. I haven't seen my brother in a long while. And this girl said, yes, sir. I came to talk to you about my brother. And, and the other gentleman said, and what's wrong with your brother? I heard my mom and dad talking. And they said, it's only a miracle that will save my brother. And I'm here to buy a miracle. How much does it cost? And the man went, really? How much does it cost? The other man said, so what's wrong with your brother? She said, I really don't know. But this is what my parents say. You know, this is what is wrong, blah, 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 blah. And the man said, you're in luck today because I happen to have that miracle you're looking for. How much do you have? And the man said, uh, the, lady, the girl said, a dollar and 11 cents. That's exactly how much that miracle cost. And then she said, he said, come, take me home to meet your parents. So they went home and the parents, you know, the parents explained to him and blah, blah, blah. And long story short, he did the surgery for free. And then later on, the, the parents were talking, you know, and they were going, oh, you know, that was a miracle. You know, if only we knew how much that surgery would have cost us. And Tess smiled, you know, just within herself, it cost a dollar 11 cents. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, that is the faith of a child. Where am I going with that story? Children, they have attributes within them where, where, where I'm trying to establish our walk in the spirit and what, you know, what, we, what is necessary. So children have attributes within them. Tess had that confident assurance that it does not matter how much, it doesn't matter the cost of a miracle, I will get that money. Even if my $1.11 is not enough, I will get more and I will pay for that miracle so that my brother won't die. Now, what are these um, attributes? Before I go to those attributes, the disciples once asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know how we are? Because I drive a Mercedes, I want to feel better than the person who's driving a Toyota. And so I want somebody to affirm me, to tell me how big, how you know, wealthy and whatever I am. And this was what the disciples were trying to do. Let's see what Jesus did. In Matthew 18, 2, 4, Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, as far as God is concerned, your PhD, sorry, professor, <laughs> 
your PhD, your master's, your whatever, doesn't, doesn't um, make you great in the sight of God. What makes you great is childlike faith, childlike trust with no heirs. Now, I looked at, you know, I just kind of scanned and looked at children. What do they possess that we've lost as adults? Children are trusting. Remember how you tell your child, oh, don't worry, just go and sit down there. I'll buy you whatever. Sweet. Okay? The child goes meekly and sits because the child is expectant. The child believed every word that you spoke. Now children are persistent. The child is sitting down. Mommy, what about the sweet you promised me? What about the candy? When am I going to get the candy? Blah, 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 blah. And you're like, okay, I'm coming. Do you know what? Until you produce the candy, that child is not going to let you go. Now children, they're unpretentious. I'm going to tell a story that happened here a few days ago. We were praying and I saw um, Caris and Asha. You know, Asha was crying and was sticking out and Caris was, you know, had a skull, blah, blah. So I called her to myself. What's happening? What's going on? She said, Asha, Asha pinched me. So I said, oh, sorry. You know, it's okay. He's your brother. Don't be angry, blah, blah. And I said, have you forgiven him? She said, not really. <laughs> You know, she just went, not really, because that's exactly what was going on in her heart. So I had to tell her, don't worry, just forgive, forgive him and let it go. Said, okay, I'll do that. And she went. This is the heart of a child. And children, they have no worries. Have you ever seen a child who's sitting on the bed and going, oh, what are we going to eat tomorrow? What am I going to wear tomorrow? No child does that. It's the parent who does that. As far as the child is concerned, I have dad, I have mom, my needs are met. And the same way God expects us to know that we have him and so our needs are met. Children are unrehearsed. No child will come to you with, you know, with a script in the head. Unlike us adults, we adults because, okay, we want to make an impression and so we... We decide that, okay, uh, this is how I'm going to walk. This is what I'm going to wear. This is uh, what, how I'm going to talk so that when those people see me. But a child, a child will come bare feet. A child will come with uh, nose dripping. <laughs> that is how this child is. And so this is how the Lord wants us to be. It, children are creative. They are joyful. Have you seen children play? They, they, you know, like, I don't know, we used to play when I was a child, mommy and daddy and uh, school teacher and whatever. You imagined the school, uh, the pupils, and you did that. And you, you know, you're just, you're just making it up. They, they make it up as they go. And that's exactly what God wants of us. You know, the Holy Spirit will inspire us. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us the will of God. The Holy Spirit will show us things. But he doesn't want us to now sit back and begin to process it through our educated minds that, oh, this doesn't really add up. And so I'm not so sure that this is going to happen. Praise the Lord. The, the, what, what, we want, what we want to establish is that when the Holy Spirit says, this is the way that it is, walk in it, just get up and do it. You know, that reminds me of how my husband taught our kids to trust. Well, I didn't like it at the time, but men, this is what you do. He put them on, the, on a counter in the kitchen and we say, jump. He's like, seriously, this is just a child, you know? And true, initially the kids would look, they would look at the floor, look at him, it's a bit, <laughs> a bit of a distance away from them, and they go, mm -mm. and they go, don't worry, I will catch you. And true, you know, I saw how, you know, the shift from that fear of falling, I saw how the shift went and my children would just launch out and true, true, my husband caught them each time. And I think they were able to make that shift because they had already understood the love of their father. They had, they had recognized that their dad had always been there. And so the same thing, we, 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 we um, experience God, you know, in, in diverse ways. Even if you've never experienced God in your life, just look at all of creation. No big bang. 
could ever create what we see today. It is all from the handwork of a loving father. So tonight, that was just an introduction to walking in the spirit. Tonight, I'm going to be concluding the remaining three attributes of um, the fruit of the spirit, which are faith, faith, meekness, and temperance. You know, God promised us in his word that, you know, his plans for us are good, to prosper us, not to harm us, and to bring us to an expected end. And so if we believe that in our hearts, when we begin to exercise our faith in him, we will, we will know that there is an established uh, truth, there is an established promise that we can bank our lives on. I, I looked at um, Hebrews 11 in the Amplified Bible, and I really like the way that um, it, it, it was said. Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, those, that are, those things that are divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen. That's the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. I thought, seriously, uh, you know, my, my work is done. If I just read that out to you, then you get it, you know? And then I went on to say, let me even see what the dictionary has to say about faith. There were different definitions, but then there was one that really caught my attention, and it is belief that, belief that is not based on proof. That's faith. You do not need to, you do not need to see it. You do not need to touch it. You do not need to smell it. You don't need to experience it with your five physical senses before you believe it. Just because God said it, that settles it. And I looked at that word assurance. Assurance is full confidence. It is freedom from doubt. It is certainty. That's how the dictionary <laughs> describes assurance, you know, and if we understand that, we know that when God has spoken his word, it is assured, it is certain, it is sealed with the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, what God expects of us, the, 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 the heart attitude that he expects of us in faith is a confident assurance, knowing that it doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what my body is feeling because God says by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Then that means my healing is reality, is a reality. I am standing here to the glory of God today because of the word of God. When I had my second child, I had a, I had a, a condition uh, that was called spontaneous symphysiotomy and they said, big word, eh? And, I, and they said, sorry, you'll never walk right again, you know, but we'll have to hold your pelvic with this metal plate. And when we do that, then maybe you'll hold a cane and walk. But as they were speaking that word, just one word came to my heart. I didn't even know where it was in the Bible then. And it says, he keepeth all his bones, not one is broken. And I held on to that word. I spoke that word over my, over my body day and night. I'm wearing here high heels. So doctors can be wrong. Praise the Lord. Now, I looked at faith and I, and I wanted to see how does faith work? Faith has four siblings. Four. <laughs> faith has four siblings. Patience, love, hope, and works. Good works. Not just any, any, any um, um, odd work. Now, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4, 18, and that fear has torment. Remember the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? They used to, you know, mingle with God. They used to talk to him. But then sin came, and they hid themselves. They hid themselves because they, they had disobeyed, they had fallen out of love with, with God. But the um, faith in, in, in its working, you know, the Bible says also that faith works, um, uh, that hope is like an ingredient. Hope is like the foundation, but hope, uh, hope in its own, on, on its own cannot 
you know, survive whatever we're believing God for because you cannot be hoping that I will get well. You have to know that you, that you are well. So we need that ingredient of hope. Hope in the word of God. Hope in the love and the faithfulness of God. Amen. Amen. Now, another, another, um, another ingredient that we need to be able to get our hope to, to, to work is, um, is, is works. Now, I said to you that when, when that, what, what happened happened, I got a word and I held on to that and I was speaking that word over myself. I could have said, well, God, you know, I know you're a faithful God and I'm just hoping that one of these days you will answer my prayers and you will hear me and you will heal me. But I, but I was focused on that word. I was focused on that word. I, I kept on, I kept on, I like it that, you know, when we're praying, we, we hold our Bibles in this church so that you are looking at the word of God and you are saying to God that this is what your word says, you know. And so I open my Bible and look at the word and I speak that word and I continue, you know, to say and I continue to see myself. I continue to like dream and, you know, begin to um, imagine, oh, on the day of my Thanksgiving, what dress will I wear? On the day of that, what, you know, uh, what high heels would I put on to dance to shame the devil? Amen. Amen. You know, so you, you, you add works to what you're believing for. You're believing God for something, sow a seed. We, 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 we're, we're hearing, sow a seed in, in, in harvesting of souls, sow a seed in service, sow a seed in, in your finances. You know, whatever you're believing God for, sow a seed that matches it. Amen. Amen. Now, I watched a movie some time ago called uh, Faith Like Potatoes. It was a real, a, a, a true story. And this man, he re relocated from Zambia where they had problems, you know, he re relocated to South Africa. And that year... You know, long story short, he got born again, and that year it was said that, well, don't bother planting potatoes because, you know, the soil is dry, there's bad drought, you know, and everything, and if you plant potatoes, you're not going to make anything. Just plant something else, granite or whatever, that can grow in dry, in dry soil. But God spoke to his heart and said, plant potatoes. So this man, he told his workers, we're planting potatoes. They went, are you mad? He said, no. God said, plant potatoes. So we'll plant potatoes. And harvest, and throughout the time, not a drop of rain. And, you know, so you think, you don't think it's only in the Bible, you know, because in, in drought, uh, uh, um, um, Isaac, he sowed. And, you know, you know what? When it was time to harvest these potatoes, the potato that he harvested, the size of these potatoes had never been seen. Hallelujah. So this is our God. When the Holy Spirit says, do this, don't rationalize. It doesn't make sense. Why should I do that? You know. But as long as you know it's the Holy Spirit saying to you to do it, just go ahead and do it. Hallelujah. Now, I looked at, um, I looked at um, love. Our sister told us with that demonstration on Monday that everything hangs on love. We, we already established that it's that when there is fear, you know, when, when, when we fall out of, um, of, you know, situation with God, then we cannot operate. We can't function in the perfect love that the Father has towards us. And so, you know, we, we, we have to keep our hearts in a position where, you know, the love of the Father is constantly being poured into our hearts and is constantly, you know, like washing us and, you know, just driving out fear, you know. So from that, we know that fear is one enemy of faith. Fear, you know, is, is, is the, the so I heard a, uh, a man of God say that fear makes cowards of people, you know. That's exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. They went to hide because they were fearful thinking, what would God do? Now we've sinned. Now doubt is another enemy of, um, of, of, of fear, uh, sorry, of faith. Uh, James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's what doubt is, double-mindedness. You know, is unstable. Today is like, hmm, okay, yes, I know my God is going to do it, you know, and then tomorrow, you look at the situations and circumstances and go, hmm, God, um, maybe it's because of 
what I didn't do well yesterday, that's why you're not answering my prayer. God is not like that. The Bible says in him there is no shifting shadows. You know, praise the Lord. Now another, another enemy of, um, of, fa of faith is presumption. Presumption, I, the, the dictionary says it's an assumption often not fully established that is taken for granted in some piece of reasoning. That means you just assume that, okay, God is going to do something that he will never promised you, maybe, and even if he promised you, you didn't back it up with works. You didn't back it up with faith like he's supposed to. You are not walking in love towards people and you assume that God is just going to do it regardless. That's not going to be. And impatience is another enemy of, of faith because you know, there's this, um, there's this gospel of, um, how shall I put it? Gospel of uh, microwave gospel. Let me put it that way. That, you know, snap your finger and God attends to you. God is not Santa Claus. There are times, the Bible talks about seed, plant, harvest. There are times when we need to wait for the manifestation of something. What I'm not saying is that God doesn't work like that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that at times, we may need to wait. A pregnant woman who finds out that she's pregnant today doesn't expect the baby tomorrow. There's a nine-month period. And so there's some things that we need to wait for. Nobody plants a seed and then tomorrow goes to dig. Are you growing seed? No, you don't do that. You wait. You wait for God to do what he has promised he would do. Amen. Amen. Now, um, because of time, I'm just going to go um, into meekness. But before I go, the one way that the Bible has assured us that we get faith is out of Romans 10. And he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is just the gospel. It is the, it is the good news that we can share with people. And when we share the good news with people, faith rises up in their hearts. They say, you know, that's, that's what testimonies does. You know, when you hear testimonies, you go, God did it for that person. God can do it for me. And you begin to do your works. You begin to work in faith and you just begin to, to establish yourself in the promise of the Lord. Now I'm going to meekness. Meekness um, the, the Greek word, don't worry, I'm not going to bother you with it. <laughs> the Greek word that translates meek, uh, to meekness is called, is, um, means mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit. Now I went into the Bible, uh, sorry, into the dictionary and I was quite surprised. The definitions are humbly patient or docile as under provocation from others overly submissive or compliant, spiritless, tame. And do you know what? Two definitions are obsolete. And they are gentle and kind. And those are the biblical, um, um, uh, yeah, they're fruit of the spirit. And they're the biblical definition of meekness. Now, we used to sing a hymn. And that hymn goes... Jesus, meek and gentle, son of God most high, pitying, well, I, if I composed it, I would have said compassionate, loving savior, hear thy children's cry, pardon our offenses, loose our captive chains, break down every idol which our soul detains, give us holy freedom, fill our heart with grace, lead us on your journey till we win the race. Does that sound like a timid person? So meekness is not about becoming a doormat where everyone just walks all over you and does whatever they want with you. But our brother touched on it a little bit on Tuesday that it is strength under control. It is you choosing that I will honor the other person above myself. That was what Esther, Esther did. When Mordecai told her that this is what is going to happen to your people, you know, initially she said, I can't go to the king because if I go, I've not been invited. I can't go. But Mordecai said, 
perhaps that's why you were put in the, in, the, in the palace for such a time as this. And she began to fast. She asked the people to fast with her. And she prayed. And then she went to the king. And the king extended the scepter of mercy towards her. And everything, even the things she didn't ask for, the king gave. And what am I saying? How do we get meekness? It's in the place of prayer and fasting. Um, in Psalm 35 and 69, David said, I humble my soul through fasting. Now you know that um, the soul is the seat of our will, our emotion, and everything. That is where pride sits. And except we go through seasons like this and, you know, have a habitual lifestyle of fasting, meekness, you know, maybe something that we'll be chasing. But praise God, this is a church that has learned to fast. This is a church that prays. And so I know that God has established people who are meek, who are humble, who are gentle in this place. Amen. Amen. Now, I read something, um, Philippians 2, which is where God talks about, um, you know, um, gentleness and, every, you know, meekness. I read it out of the message, and I really like the way that it explained it. It said, if you've gotten anything out of all, uh, sorry, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others to get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of the status, no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, if even those long ago dead and buried will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Amen. Now, the Bible says God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Now, we, we understand from that scripture that I just read that one of the ways to become meek is obedience just obey. Obey what the word of God says. Be selfless. Amen. Now I will, I'm rushing because I'm aware of time. Amen. Now, uh, the last one, temperance or self-control. I found in Titus uh, chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. And it says, for the free gift of eternal salvation is now being offered to everyone. And along with this gift comes the realization that God wants us to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures and to live good god fairy lives day by day. Now, temperance is habitual moderation in the indulgence of a natural appetite or passion. And that word temperance is interchangeable with self-control. And the, the Greek word that translates to uh, temperance or self-control is that it's the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. Now we have five senses. That's how we function in this world, with our five senses. But when you, when you now sit, everything you process through your five senses. Everything just has to please your, your flesh. Everything has to, you know, you know, suit what your what you know your flesh would feel good about. Then that is not being temperate. Usually when you talk about temperance in the world, the world begins to think about um, alcohol and not drinking excess alcohol. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you being able to, you know, um, 
check your, 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 your flesh. Put your flesh in check. You know, the Bible says we've been given all things to freely enjoy. So God is not opposed to us enjoying, but it is when it is too much. When you sit in front of the TV for 10 hours in a day, you know, you binge, you binge uh, uh, watch TV. Well, I confess, at times, I do binge watch some shows, well, a particular show that I like, but haven't seen for months. And I'll take maybe a Saturday and I think, oh, let's catch up on, on, the, on, the, um, on the episodes. But when the Holy Spirit said, enough, it's time to get up and do something else. That's where the line, that's where you draw the line. You can say, oh, well, yeah, maybe one more episode, you know. But praise the Lord. We who have been born again, the, the law of uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus resides inside of us. And we are able to control ourselves. That was what David did. The spring that kings went out to war, he sat at home. He didn't go. And then his eyes saw. And he didn't stay there. His eyes saw. Then his finger beckoned. His finger didn't stay there. And then he committed adultery against another man. Like that wasn't enough. The woman got pregnant. He now planned to kill the man. You see, that is how, you know, when, when we don't have temperance, it just graduates. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But that is not our portion in Jesus' name. What, where am I taking us tonight? Galatians 5.1 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Verse 16, But, say, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. In Romans 7, Paul began to say that my flesh war against, they're warring against each other. My flesh and my spirit are warring against each other. Verse 18 now tells us, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Can we rise to our feet tonight and just begin to speak to the Lord? Begin to establish your begin to establish your yourself in that word that says that you are born again, you are born of the spirit, and so you will walk in the spirit. You will live by the spirit. Father, we give you praise. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your word, oh God. That is our shield. Thank you, Lord, for your word, oh God. That, that, is, that is our limiter. Father God, we just thank you. We praise your holy name, oh God. Thank you, Father.